Hey, what's going on? It's Johnny King, and this is the Johnny King Show, and I happen to be with the one and the only Lewis House. What's up, buddy? Johnny K. Johnny K. <laughs> Lewis House. What's up, man? What's up, man? Not much. I'm so grateful to have you uh, here and just be hanging out in your beautiful School of Greatness uh, back Studio. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> That's not yeah, like man. a bathroom or something, is it? No, it's an actual studio. But I know I should just have this everywhere I go, just like a little setup with lights and a sign. <laughs> just <laughs> branded. There's a backdrop. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. drop it down. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm having fun. So pretty. So pretty. Um, well, I have this uh this very professional, beautiful bio uh of yours. But I kind of feel like I, I know you, but it, for anyone who's been or is listening in You knew me before everything. <clears throat> knew you, you met before. me when I was thirteen. Yes. Yes. I want to talk about that in just a second. But if you haven't heard of Lewis Howes, you need to check him out. He's got one of the, uh, the top 100 podcasts in the world, the School of Greatness. Um, he's become, a, as this says, a, a media sensation, empowering people and sharing greatness around the globe. Um, <clears throat> he's wrote, written a New York Times bestselling book, uh, which was cool, the, the School of Greatness, which is really cool because you were here in Denver, right? You were doing a book tour. Right. We got yes. that call. That's and you crazy. were at the top of that and we were celebrating. I think it was at your apartment. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that big apartment. <laughs> I know. It was like a studio apartment at the time, right? Yeah. I think your, our feet were just like hitting each other. <laughs> I know. I was like sleeping on your couch or something. I can't remember. I had to pull out like. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. Did I stay with you? Did I, did I stay there, didn't I? Yeah, yeah you stayed with Those me. Those were still the days, like, even though I was making money, I still had this mindset of, like, I need to stay for free everywhere I go. I need to crash on couches. It was only five years ago, not even. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I was like, I need that. I was like, I'm going to take a middle seat, back, back row, Southwest ticket, the lowest price, at the, like, worst hour to get somewhere. I was still just, like, save, 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 and just, you know. But you did it, man. But it was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. That was, that was a fun memory. We, I, I remember I, we went out to breakfast the next morning for pancakes. And there was, there was some dude who was like, you're Lewis House. <laughs> I just got your book. And you were like, oh, hey. That's hey, funny. Can I enjoy my pancakes? Were you running with me when I got the call or did I come back afterwards? No, you oh. were, we, were, we were together. Yeah. We were running. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> so Around that park. What was that park? I can't remember. Cheese, Cheeseman Park here in Denver, Colorado. But anyway, so, so he's written uh, Mask of Masculinity, which is amazing, especially since I'm doing a lot of men's work these days. Um, but man, from Sister's Couch, like we said, even, even before that, 13 years old that I knew you from, and to, uh, to who you are today, hanging out with some of the most influential people of our time, um, <clears throat> Tony Robbins and uh, the late Kobe Bryant and everything mm -hmm. else. Uh, you've had some amazing people on your podcast, so... Thank Thanks, man. Taking some time for me. Of course. Doesn't it feel weird that we've known each other for 23 years of life? That is kind of crazy. Like, where is 23 years gone? Oh, that's what I keep thinking. It's like, the older we get, the faster it goes. Dude. Yeah. And you're, how old are you now? 40? Yeah. <laughs> are you 40 right now? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm 37, and I'm going to be, you know, I feel like I'm going to hit 40 like this. And I was actually talking to a, a friend of mine today, you know, Chris Lee. I was talking to him this morning. He's 55. He goes, between 40 and 50 is going to be in a half a second. Yeah. I'm like, oh, man, it's crazy. I know. Let's enjoy it. Like, uh, one of our mutual friends had his birthday just a couple of days ago, 39. I was like, dude, enjoy it. It's all downhill from here, which is, I'm so kidding. It's, it only gets better. But, uh, man. yeah, it's, there's like the it's weird, man. Aches and pains start. You Doesn't know. it feel like I've only known you for like maybe. I mean, 23 years seems like a long time. Doesn't it feel like eh, maybe like 12 years ago we met back in middle school and high school? It's like, well, I remember what that was, the first time we met was at the basketball camp. camp. Yeah. And you were schooling somebody. I know. I remember vividly uh, I did some layup, like reverse layup, and I did some move trying to be like Michael Jordan or something, and it went in. And you were like, he's not even a freshman. <laughs> I remember you saying that, like, he's not even a freshman. He schooled you. <laughs> He's an eighth grader <laughs> <laughs> against some um, like varsity team we were playing against. That was that was before I was into helping helping raise people up. Was like, <laughs> that was not a not only you suck. He's younger than you think he is. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, playing was with, 
I was playing with like the varsity team in a summer camp. Yeah. At Southwest Missouri State or something. Southwest yeah, Missouri exactly. State. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I was like playing some refs with you guys. Or I think we had two teams or something, so I was mixed in a little bit. Yes. yes. <clears throat> One time. I was pissed because my freshman year I didn't make varsity. I was so mad. <laughs> so I was like, I can beat these guys, you know, but we, I dominated on junior varsity and got a lot of reps, which was powerful, actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. It all, it all worked out. I mean, it's like, uh, <clears throat> It's like the the Jordan documentary now. Like he he got cut right, and then that gave him the fire. Exactly. Yeah. So you, but you had the fire. You had the the work ethic from the get go that I saw. Right. Mm-hmm. Even as a thirteen year old. Yeah. But but as you've talked about, and and for those people that may be tuning in that don't know your story, you had the chip on your shoulder for a while. Right. It was all about proving myself and like proving other people wrong. Yeah. So my drive was based on like I'm going to be the best to prove you wrong. Yeah. That was the whole my whole life essentially for a couple of decades you you i i will never forget the the practice i walked on that one year my super senior year of, of football mm-hmm. and you caught and i was playing they were like oh let's just stick him at free safety you know because he played defense and soccer this will be the same it's just kind of like reading you know reading the the offense defense and basketball i was a sophomore you were a senior right yeah yeah and this is practice and you caught one going through the middle and then i see the you know i was like ha and you <laughs> bowled me over i just remember seeing blue sky and my feet and then landing and looking over my shoulder and there you were just trucking into the end zone i was like you got mad too you got really bad i think you were like F you. <laughs> but that i remember that was a actually a powerful moment i think i remember this moment vividly. was it the first day of practice or first day of pads or something in college football i, I was so not ready for that <laughs> i think it was a powerful moment for the whole team not just that play or that moment but just like I remember I came on the team new and I was like, I'm here to play and we all need to step up. And I think just the whole practice, everyone was like so intense. Yeah. And yeah. it wasn't, I wasn't saying that I was the one to cause that, but I think we were all just like, this is going to be a powerful season for us, but we got to start from the beginning, like just knocking people on their butt and hitting hard and this and that. So, yeah. Well, and that's, and I, I wonder if you still have that videotape somewhere. Do you have that still? Yeah, I have it. No way. Send yeah. me that. Did we Because we had the practice fo- footage. Dude, send me that clip. I have, I have, I don't even know. I got to look for it. It's probably got to be stowed away. At, in, Dude, I got to see that. That'd be I got, amazing. You know, like even your whole highlight VHS. I made that highlight video. Which has, which has me oftentimes on the other side of the field, just raising my hands. <laughs> running while you're while you're running into the end Dude, i would love to find that tape and try to make it digital and yeah. put it out there on my instagram oh totally if you have that still let me know oh, totally I'll, I'll look around for it and see if i can find yeah. it i've gotten rid of a lot of stuff John, johnny used to be an amazing video editing producer 20 years ago <laughs> I don't know we made a lot of videos for people actually from our our uh hawaii uh trip to college yeah. football highlights that was so fun you were the man. Yeah, Lewis and I, we, we, we hung out and lived together in Hawaii and Waikiki. Three months. It was yeah. what, three of us in a room for three months, two months, waking up at 6 a.m. every morning. It was intense, man. What was your favorite memory from that trip? <sighs> Probably the first weekend when we didn't have homework or anything. We just went to like <laughs> – we went up. I think we went up and saw Ben, a friend of ours, up in like the mountains and hiked this unbelievable like tropical mountain. Yeah. We were in the back of a truck, pickup truck. Do you remember this? Yes. His mom was like driving us around yeah. and just like being like, oh, it's going to be an amazing trip <laughs> if it's all like this. And then we just worked 24 seven for two months <clears throat> because the teacher was like, we're on this abroad to Hawaii for the first time. And they were like, we're going to make sure you work five times harder than any other student. Yeah. I really liked actually after a while of getting up early, I liked getting up and doing the outrigger canoe paddling together. That was that the was, best. That was fun. It was like 6 a.m. Like, workouts in the yeah. ocean. Like being as a team. Safe. Yeah all like working it together that was fun that was was pretty clutch i i think and there's another memory that i have from that that uh speaks to how far you've come Mm. which has been amazing was that i remember we were reading one of those horrible hawaiian history books out loud and i remember sitting there and you aloha yeah yeah and you were reading out loud but not well wow it was that bad huh it was pretty bad and i was thinking like Oh my gosh! Like, granted, you're a freshman in college. He's a college student. I was a, dude, I was a soft. I was a junior. No, you're right, because I came back after. <laughs> yeah, I was a junior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I couldn't read then. You couldn't read very well at all, and I was scratching my head like, 
And I remember asking you, like, what, what do you want to do with your life? And you're like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, play football, and, catch a football or something. Yeah. yeah, be rich and famous. I don't know, something like that. You know, it's like, and I was like, oh, good luck, man. You know. Yeah. And and to go from your learning disabilities, so, and talk about that a little bit, just because I'm sure there's people that are listening to have their own lack of belief systems or their inabilities or disabilities and learning whatever. But how did you work through? I mean, I still struggle today. I'll, I'll even read aloud uh, today, and it's very challenging. I think I'm just okay with it. I accept it. And yeah. I'm, a, I'm a lot better now because I've just done a lot of practice. But my entire life, I struggled reading to myself. And then reading aloud was like the ultimate kryptonite. It was like yeah. anytime I had to stand in front of the class mm-hmm. and at print, they did this a lot of Principia where they have you, you know, all the kids read like a chapter or a paragraph. And it was just terrifying when it came to me because I just, I don't know, I just felt so embarrassed. I felt like everyone was such a s- smarter a student they were a much faster reader and i felt like i was so slow and you probably feel like <clears throat> when you're insecure around something like if you have a mole or something on your face you probably feel like everyone's noticing it even more because it's insecure to you <clears throat> but i just remember a lot of times just getting like me trying to say simple words and people laughing in class and just feeling like wow my life is over even though it was a small thing but in that mm-hmm. moment it felt like the biggest thing in the world of course And just a confirmation of when I went to print uh, eighth grade, they tested me when I got there. And essentially they were like, okay, you have a second grade reading level when I got to eighth grade. Cause I didn't really do anything before then in school. Yeah. And I think they either just said like, you have to go to this tutor every single day. So during recess at lunch in eighth grade and through high school, I would go with a teacher and she would read a magazine, a newspaper, and I would read it and practice it. And we would do evaluations all the time during recess and during lunch break. So it sucked to like have to go do extra work every single day, all the way through high school until my senior year in high school. Um, I'm forgetting her last name. Mrs. Uh, Herschel, I think it was Mrs. Heimrich, Heimrich, Herschel. Yeah. yeah. She was an English teacher and she like halfway through senior year, she was like, Lewis, like, you're failing and just to let you know you like you can't go play football in college if you don't pass english senior year mm-hmm. and i was like what do i do and she's like well you need to be here every day after school and practice with me and i'll be here to help you and it, i remember just like the most basic quizzes that i couldn't figure out i couldn't remember vocabulary i couldn't comprehend it it's hard to read it and she was really stood for me that whole senior year to give me a pass you know enough to pass to get into college. I had like a 2.0 GPA or whatever, or whatever I needed, 2.4 or something to get into college. And um, so I worked for it all through middle school, high school. And it wasn't until college when <clears throat> we had to write so many five page papers that I finally like found out a system that worked for me to like, okay, what's the system that I can figure out to write a five page paper in one hour? Because I never did anything until the last minute. They called me last minute Lewis. Yeah. Even today, I still wait to the last minute to do a lot of things, but I figured out like how to do this an hour before class when I had two weeks to do it. How do I put this together? Yeah. And I just got really good. I think the pressure, like the needing to do it right now, I got really good at like, what's my headline? What's the subject? What's the thesis? What's the ending? And what's the research, you know, pulling it all in yeah. to where I was able to make it work. But yeah, no way that I ever think I'd be a writer or creating content or, right. you know, writing books, like when I couldn't even read the books. So right. it was, it was a challenge, but I think if you practice something enough, uh, it doesn't mean you're going to be the master of reading out loud. Even today I'll, I'll read. And I was reading my bio actually a couple of weeks ago and I was messing up reading my bio, but it just, I think I'm at a point of confidence where I'm like, okay, like who cares if someone makes fun of me or if I stutter, Yeah. Like, look at all the good I'm doing. And I just try to focus on, like, I'm trying to help people and inspire people. And if I mess up, then that's yeah. another story I can share of inspiration now. So yeah. I'm a lot less insecure. Maybe if there was, like, I'm reading in front of the president of the United States or, or something like that, maybe I'd be more insecure. But <clears throat> maybe, yeah, maybe more nervous. I think we all would, right? Yeah. But I do feel like you, you, you put a post up just recently about, like, the just being, being, um, you know, being out of resources or being resourceful. Resourceful, yeah. You know, and so many people make those excuses of, oh, I don't have the time or the money 
or I can't read or like you, you of all people have had more than enough reasons or excuses to have not become a quote unquote success. Right. right. So how did you, cause you're like, it's not only practice over time. Cause I totally agree, but it has so much more to do. I feel like with the mindset. Of success, yeah. Right. So what, what do you feel like is that? Because I know that I feel yeah. like sh- you speak to that a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think, I mean, listen, I struggled in school all the way through college. It took me seven years to finish and get a degree in college. And it just wasn't fun. So I had to figure out like, what's something, the one class I really loved in college was a leadership class. And literally we did a class about like personal branding with, uh, it might've been after you were gone, but I did one with my coach, Ann Pearson. And there was a leadership class that Lee Ellis taught, your old soccer coach, I think he was, or, um, and he had some great stuff. So when I was around a topic that I was excited about, then I could focus, then I could create, then I could learn yeah. around the things I was excited about. When it's everything else I wasn't excited about. There was right. nothing that school taught me that I was excited about. I was excited to hang out with friends. I was excited to play hacky sack outside, play Frisbee, ultimate Frisbee, Frisbee golf football sports like I was excited to be around people and just connect and I think that's what I learned after sports was done for me was I like to connect with people and that's why LinkedIn became a tool that I was good at because I was like okay I don't understand this tool to start but it's all about connecting with people and that's all I want to do all day Mm -hmm. and so when I was on my sister's couch after playing arena football and I got injured I was like I was on there six seven eight hours a day just because I loved it and then when you like something or you enjoy something or you love something, you will research and learn how to become better at it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's finding the, the motivation f- around the topics you're interested in yeah. and leaning into that skill set you have. I yeah. think just for me, traditional school didn't provide the, the aspects that I enjoyed until after school was over at sports. Yeah. That's where I put my time and attention and focus because I enjoyed it. Right. So <clears throat> one of the reasons I created the School of Greatness was because I said, I want people like me in the world who struggled from learning about how to, you know, in school, they taught you, they taught us how to memorize quizzes and tests and do scantrons and all these things, but they didn't teach us how to cope with our emotions after getting a D or an F over and over again. They taught us Mm -hmm. how to, you know, do homework, but they didn't teach us how to handle deal with people being bullies on the playground or kids laughing at you when you make a mistake. You know, they didn't teach us how to deal with heartache from a relationship. They didn't teach us how to make money right. or understand accounting and finances. All these things I wish they would have taught us or what we need in the real world, yeah. they didn't teach us. Right. Kind of had to figure it out through just social circles and all these things or your parents. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I want to create something for people like me, people who struggled in school, people who didn't feel like they got everything out of the school they wanted to help them in their personal life to, to grow, to improve. And I was like, why don't I create my own school, School of Greatness, and, mm-hmm. and go find the best teachers in the world and learn from them and try to simplify because things in school were so complicated to me that I couldn't even get to the first page of a book because it was so complicated. Just the idea of picking out a big textbook having it on my table, I was just like, after so many years, I was just like, I'm never going to remember any of this. I'm never going to learn any of this. I can't read any of this. Why even do it? Right. Like it gets so defeating that I was like, why even do this? If it's not going to help me, it's going to be horrible. I'm not going to enjoy it. I'm not going to memorize it or use any of it. So I was like, what if I could create something where I find the best in the world where I can get them to share this dense information that might seem scary to me or to people and make it simple, make it fun, and kind of translate the information in the way where someone like me can understand it. And if I can understand it, then hopefully a lot of people could understand it. Yeah. And that's, that's what I decided to do. So I learned how to take my, a lot of pain and adversity and challenges and frustration from years, of not being able to understand things and saying, I want to understand this better to help me and hopefully help a lot of people in the same situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's, what's inspiring about it too, uh, and you touch on, on a lot of different good points there, is that, like you said, like I often think about it. What's what's the difference between times that I feel like I'm working and times that I feel like I'm playing, and and the way that I s- kind of distinguish that is like work usually is for someone else's intention or motivation. You play is always when I want to do it, you know. And so that's why I love creating what I create because the the line between work and play is, is so gray there's blurred it feels like 
I'm yeah. working and playing simultaneously all day long, right? Yeah, yeah. This is work with you, but I'm having, this is play to me as well. Yeah, right? of course. And so that's, that's why people really excel at playing, you know, and why work is, oh, I'm working for the man. I'm working for a motive that's outside of me, right? Yeah. And to your point though, it's like what shifted for you is you're, you, you're kind of taking your, your mess in your life, if you will, and turning it into your message <clears throat> and your purpose and, and the, the wind in your sails. For a lot of people, I think, feel like they have to do things in life to make money, to put food on the table, to provide. And they don't, they think, oh, you're just privileged because you get to, to play. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's, you know, a lot of people in the coaching space or people in nutrition and fitness or people in relationship coaches, things like that business coaches it's like a lot of people become a coach and the ones that do it successful are the ones that had a big challenge that they needed to overcome they were broke and they needed to figure out money they were 100 <laughs> pounds overweight and they needed to lose weight like you taught people for years yeah. they were you know in a broken marriage and they needed to learn about relationships with themselves and other people and i think some of the best coaches are the ones that had to lose the weight had to overcome the debt had to do this and they figured out a system that worked for them. And then now they're going to coach other people what worked for them. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this because I need it. And now it's going to be fun. And it's going to be fun teaching this to other people because I know how much freedom I have on the other, on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you're absolutely right. In, in your documentary, Chasing Greatness, which if you haven't seen it, not you, but those listening, have you seen your own documentary? <laughs> Too many times. <laughs> remind it. Remind I've, it. I've reviewed it and edited it so many times. Um, but you, you talk about the kind of courageous decision to talk about the, the sexual molestation that you've gone yeah, through. Yeah. Um, and I have seen, just because of, of all the work that you've done and, and I've done and how our paths have kind of uh, yeah. intertwined, how much you've shifted from that chip on your shoulder, Lewis, you know, uh -huh. to such a, a, a more genuine, authentic loving human being yeah. <clears throat> and it happened during that time of healing kind of tell maybe those that are listening or watching yeah i think my whole life was to prove people wrong to be the best to be number one to be competitive at everything and i was still like a loving person but i think yeah. it just when it got into that zone of like competition in some way it was like okay i need to be a little bit farther i need to be a little bit better you know it's like i'll do whatever it takes to be the best yeah. and that that um that got certain rewards, right? Having that mentality got certain rewards. I'm not, see, I'm not sure if you're watching The Last Dance right now. It's unbelievable with Jordan. Yeah. And it got him certain rewards to be with that mentality at his level. And it also has certain prices that you got to pay yep. as well. So you just got to be okay with the prices. And the prices I paid for having this mindset of the world is out to get me. Everyone is against me. No one believes in me. Um, Everyone's trying to take advantage of me. That was a big thing. It was like, everyone's trying to take advantage of me. Everyone's trying to abuse my good nature. Like me wanting to help everyone. They're all trying to abuse it. Yeah. Those were the stories that I told myself, I think because I never really healed a few memories from the past yeah. and experiences that I faced from the sexual abuse stuff, which was big. One of my first memories is being sexually abused in a bathroom. And, you know, I think I had maybe two or three memories before that that I can truly remember. But at five years old, I was sexually abused. And I remember it just being a story in my mind every single day for 25 years until I actually put it out into the world and started to heal with it. Mm -hmm. And there were other situations of memories of me feeling abused or taken advantage of, not sexually, it only happened one time, thankfully. But there were other situations where I felt abused and taken advantage of by kids in elementary school or picked on and made fun of in the locker room, whatever it was, uh, in classroom, reading aloud, like things like that, were feeling like I was never going to be good enough. And right. so that drove me to say, screw the world. I'm going to destroy anyone that comes in my way. I don't care if I have to kill myself to do it the type of mentality. I don't care what I have to sacrifice. No one is going to, uh, have power over me, manipulate me, take advantage of me, whatever. <clears throat> and it's just a very destructive uh, way of living life. Yeah. It's funny because I would do that, <clears throat> reflecting back, I would 
live that way in every area of my life, business, sports, family. But when it came to intimate relationships, it's almost like I was the opposite. I would do everything to please the person to make sure that they wouldn't like, that they would like me or something, or that they would <laughs> always love me. Or, and I was afraid to be alone at that point. Yeah. So I was that way with everything except for relationships, which was weird. Um, <clears throat> but I, uh, yeah. And then I was all about competition. And I was about collaboration until someone wanted to try to be better than me. Hmm. And then it was like, okay, I need to be a little bit better. And then I realized like life is about collaboration, not about competition. You can still be competitive and you can still want to win, <clears throat> but if it's at all costs and if it's at like at the extent of hurting others and hurting relationships, it doesn't make sense. So I still think there's a way you can be the best in sports be your best in sports, win a championship, but also have great sportsmanship. Also, you know, throw the ball to other people to see them win, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, well, I'm writing, you know, I told you I'm writing this book kind of about becoming Kings, you know, which is ultimately in my mind, a, a King in my mind is just about being abundant in all areas of your life. <clears throat> so you have abundance in your health in the healthy relationships, healthy finances, healthy spirituality, healthy emotional fitness, all of that stuff, right? <clears throat> Very much like, like greatness. And, and the thought is, um, in that sense of what you were, what you were just referring to, <clears throat> I talk about the, the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. And, and so many people that I see, and I, I grew up with a father kind of like that, who was hurting and injured and so driving towards once I, you know, accomplish wealth or once I accomplish success, then I will have the love and the respect uh, only to come to find out that like, no, if you've deserted your, your children, your family, <clears throat> excuse me, for 30 years, like they're all going to hate you, which I did. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it was when he came out that he was gay that I started having so much more empathy. I'm like, oh, this is not just my dad. This is just another brother who happens to be on the path ahead of me. Yeah. Man, he's so, he was so kind of injured and wounded and just looking for love that he hadn't done a whole lot of that art of fulfillment side. And so how do you go about managing you're highly driven still to the state, even though you've healed that chip on your shoulder in some regards, yeah. you're still driven, if not more driven. But I also see that kind of uh, intimate uh, fulfillment side that you're focused on. How are you balancing between that when you're super busy, but then also it's tough because my girlfriend wants more time with me and I want to work more because uh, I love it. I feel like it's a part of my mission. It's play, right? Yeah, it's play. I love it. I feel like the work is never going to be finished. You know, my mission is to impact 100 million people a week through providing them inspiring stories, lessons, tools, media to inspire them. And, you know, we're not even close to it. So it's like I want to get there faster while doing the right things. I know it's going to take time. I'm patient as well, but it's like, there's always more I could be doing. So it's just learning to create structure and boundaries. You know, it's learning to create structure for myself because I'm also committed to my relationship and I'm also committed to love and the feeling of inner peace in a relationship because I know personally for myself that if I'm a single man, I'm a dangerous human being. I'm a dangerous in the sense that, uh, as a kid, I got no attention. No girls liked me, yeah. you know, not until like my, you know, I was in college maybe or after college. It was like, I wasn't really getting attention from a lot of girls. I yeah. was tall, goofy, skinny. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't smart, all these things. And now I have so much confidence in myself and a lot of like humility as well. I think so. Um, maybe people don't think I do, but I feel like I have confidence and humility. Yeah. And I'm also know my value. I just know what I'm worth. I know my value. I know, um, and I, you know, even if, even if I post my girl every single day on social media, so many women hit me up constantly yeah. and message me and flirt with me and I never respond to them and I never reply to them and send me, you know, videos of them naked, all this stuff. Like I know I would be a dangerous person single yeah. and I would probably just want to have a lot of fun. Yeah. And that takes a lot of energy, time, and it's ultimately never been fulfilling for me to live that lifestyle because I've lived it for a few months at a time yeah. in between relationships. And as, um, as fun and as um, maybe satisfying of a superficial feeling that it is for me, it's never a fulfilling feeling and it's never enough. Mm. So... Um, <clears throat> For me, I know that my relationship is extremely important and I want to 
cultivate it. So I'm, I'm doing things daily that I used to do with the first six months of us long distance. I'm doing them still because I know it's what she loves. I know it's what makes her feel connected and protected and uh, at peace with me. And, right. and, um, and quality time is important. So for me, I, I'm trying to focus on that and just make it a structure. So I cut, you know, seven o'clock for me is when I usually go home, but I could stay at the office till nine, 10. Like I would just be here all day if I could, but it's, it's hard for me to get out and I push it to seven fifteen and seven thirty. but I'm like, I tell her I'm going to be back by seven. And, and the goal is to try to shut it down yeah. and just spend a few hours of quality time. <laughs> right. So, right. Which is, it's, it's never feel, it doesn't feel like work. Like you said, it just feels like yeah. I want to make sure I fulfill uh, mm-hmm. my mission and be fully used up towards that service yeah. because we saw with Kobe and lots of people that their time was up before they know it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just want to make sure that I don't look back and say, Oh, I wish if I got injured, I wish I would have done more mm-hmm. for the skills that I have, the tools mm-hmm. that I have to give to others. And I think that's just the way I'm wired. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, sure. but that's just, how I want to look at myself, you yeah. know, it's like the, uh, the identity that I want to have for myself to feel proud of. Right. Well, I want people to, especially guys that are listening, but, but females too, of course, but um, to come out of this conversation, maybe having gotten some practical strategic nuggets as well. Right. So it sounds like you're talking about creating boundaries, uh-huh. um, not only for <laughs> when you're working, but also when you're not right. Cause uh-huh myself you my dad like i just know a lot of guys that can become workaholics yeah. we find our significance through it mm-hmm. but at like you said at the risk of what you know our, our intimate partner kind of being emotionally starved on the exactly side, right yeah so how would you recommend guys kind of structuring their day or what what is it to find i remember that? um i think you gotta figure out what works for you and what works for your partner i remember hearing an interview with urban meyer who i interviewed him as well he was the coach of ohio state football and a bunch of other college football teams i think he won like four or five national championships or something and he mentioned how his football coaching became an obsession essentially i mean at some point you've got to make it be obsessed in order to be the best in the world what you do but it was hurting his relationship with his wife and his kids yeah and so he made a commitment where he's like at this time, every single day, I can't remember what time it was or something noon every single day, no matter what's happening, if he's in the middle of a meeting, he's calling his wife for 15 minutes and saying hello and disconnecting for those 15 minutes or five minutes, something like that. Yeah. During this uh, COVID stuff, I've been, my girlfriend's doesn't have her acting class and her English class, which she was having before in her, her normal routine. And I was kind of just going to my office, which is a block away from where we live and going from like a nine to eight every day, just for the first couple of weeks. And she was like, I really would love to be able to have lunch with you because I don't see you at all. And I'm here by myself alone. And so now every day I go home for an hour and I'm in the middle of, it's hard to like break me up. I'm like, I'm in the middle. I want to go, I want to build, I want to create, but I go there for an hour. I put my phone aside, I connect with her and we have lunch. I just got back two minutes before this recording. And I know it's important to her and it makes her feel connected and it brings more peace in our relationship (laughs) because I'm taking those actions. This morning I wrote her a little letter and just put it on her, her desk with, I got her flowers on Saturday, even though she's not a mom, she's a mom to a dog. So I got her flowers on Saturday for mother's day. I was like, happy mother's day to the dog. It's not that we're having kids anytime soon, but happy (laughs) mother. And, um, and I took a couple of the flower petals, I put it on the paper and just wrote like a 10 seconds, like, this is what you mean to me. Yeah. And I did that this morning. And so it's like that little thing. And she, when she woke up, she got it. She sent me a message. I had lunch with her and I'm going to go back around seven after I work out and spend a few hours and, and just like cultivating that yeah. because I know what a relationship is like when it's stressful and it's anxious and you resent the person. Yep. I know you've been in those left relationships yep. and I feel like I've made enough mistakes in the last 15 years of relationships to be like, okay, if I'm going to be in this, that means I've got to do things differently. That means I've got to step up in ways that she wants and needs, not that I only want and need. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's not normal to think this way. It's not normal to do things that you're not used to doing. It's, it takes a commitment and an effort to like, all I wanted to do was get up, shower and get out the door this morning but i was like 
I literally wake up every morning. I'm going to say, what's going to make my, my lady smile today? Like, what's the thing I can do to make her smile? And maybe that's not the right way of looking at things, but I want peace in my relationship and I want fulfillment. And it brings her a sense of love that she's never had, which <clears throat> makes her give me a lot of love that I've never had. And I'm like, but all it takes is doing a few nice things and thinking about her and being, I think Tony Robbins says like, what's lacking in your relationship is creativity and caring or something like that. It's like showing you care and showing it in a creative way. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to get flowers every day but it's, it's being in tune to what she says. Like last week, she pulled up a photo on her phone of a note that I had wrote her like a year ago when we were doing long distance. And she goes, oh, remember this when you used to write me notes? And I was just like, okay, mental note. Like, <laughs> like I say everything to her every morning about how I feel, but I guess she likes to read it too. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not something that is, comes natural, I think, to us in general. Yeah. But I think because I'm, putting the attention on it it's just bringing so much more abundance in our relationship which is yeah. creating more abundance in my life right and so you know i'm not perfect i still make mistakes with her but i'm just trying to do the best i can yeah exactly and i think it goes to the whole idea of, of the love languages you know and if had i read that sooner in my relationships i probably could have saved a lot of heartache but it's like to actually know what your what your girl or your your partner's uh love language is and then actually the thing. potentially to fulfill it right here's the thing and also with her she originally like she was getting me all these like big gifts and stuff like in the first like six nine months of us being there like expensive things like nice shoes like all this stuff that i'm like this is cool but it's not what i need like yeah, yeah. i'm like she got me like a nice bracelet a couple thousand dollars like damn this is amazing but i like we got this bracelet on the literally the third day we met that was 50 cents at a little street market that I wear every single day yeah. where she got this like few thousand dollar, like <clears throat> Cartier bracelet that I've worn like for a week because it kind of hurts my hand. It's like this golden thing. You're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and, she, but she was like, I'm like, Oh, so oh, this is amazing, but I'm just not a big like gift guy for me. Like I wear the same like $20 black shirt every day. I'm like pretty simple. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, I'm pretty simple. Like I don't need big gifts or anything. But what I realized is she likes gifts and experiences because she was giving it. So even though someone says they maybe don't care what the actions they give to you is what they want typically. So you got to be in tune is what I've learned of my 37 years of existence of messing up over and over. So, right. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm curious to hear because <clears throat> one, one of the things I've enjoyed seeing on social media is like little glimpses into, into high profile, like Ellen's house or, uh, you know, Chris Martin's house, you know, other celebrities, musicians to see, and, there, and there's a different type of like vulnerability and rawness to it, to see them playing music in their house or being with their family, uh, Jimmy Fallon, like what have been some things that throughout the COVID stuff, what's been one of the more challenging things for you and what's been one of more of the, like the surprisingly enjoyable things? The challenging thing is, <clears throat> um, it's really just probably managing, the the expectations that weren't met for my girlfriend because she <clears throat> moved here Christmas Day to Los Angeles from Mexico mm -hmm. with plans with intentions. <laughs> she was starting English class, which was like four hours a day of intensive English. She had these acting like boot camps and workshops she was doing. She was you know creating content. She was doing all these other things. So her plans and her expectations w w were over. Yeah. And I think um, her being away from her family for this long in Mexico and not having the ability to fly back right now just because of COVID <clears throat> um, and other challenges that were happening in Mexico with her family and her not being able to be there and then me being gone all day. It's, yeah. you know, and making sure that I can make her feel safe and protected and support her during this time. So it was like, you know, just, all I want to do is focus on work and, you know, I want to make sure that if our relationship is going to work, then I need to focus on her too. And I think that was, uh, you know, just taking the time and energy and where it's not me getting to do everything I want to do all the time. It's now two people and yeah. she's got needs and wants and yeah. being okay with that and, and supporting it and cultivating it, you know, and we've got a dog and everything like that. So it's like living with someone, having a new responsibility with her, having a responsibility with a dog, like yeah. changing lifestyle habits, changing routines, 
and creating new ones to create hopefully a more fulfilling uh, and thriving life. So I think that's just a lot, a lot of change <clears throat> came my way, came her way uh, over the last five months in general. And not allowing myself to feel overwhelmed from it all because there were moments of overwhelm. And instead, one of the blocks, I want to know if it's blocks or if it's more like um, just decisions that I've decided to make over the last 10 years is like, I don't want to have a big team. I want to have a small lean team and try to push the team to scale the impact and income as much as we can. And I never felt comfortable or confident with, because I've never done it. I've never built a big team, so I don't know how to do it, right? right. And so I was like, I feel comfortable with the, like five <clears> to 10 <throat> people and having agencies and contractors and kind of running it that way. And literally yesterday we brought on two new hires, like kind of higher level individuals. Like I've never invested in like a high level uh, people that way. Uh, and I'm looking to bring on like three to four more people in the next like month. And actually it's teaching me with all the focus back on like, okay, I've got to take these breaks. I'm, I'm going to go back for lunch. I'm going to come back early. That means I can't do all the work myself the way I've done it. I need to find great people and let them do it. Absolutely. And I've never done that. I've always been like, well, I don't know if I trust anyone else hundred percent or no one can do it as good as me or whatever my ego is saying. And people can probably do things a lot better than me. And I'm also doing a disservice to the world by limiting my efforts because I can only do so much every day. <clears throat> but by investing in team and structure in processes, I can scale the same message in different formats to reach more people. So yeah. really, I've been very selfish in thinking this way as opposed to how do you find the right people and, and <clears throat> build that. So that's that, cha that challenge and these changes have caused friction, which have made me say, what am I not doing I need to do to grow? Yeah. And that's building a team in-house and kind of growing my, my business that way. So yeah. it's, been, it's been a beautiful, it's been a very stressful first couple of months, but then beautiful last few months. Yeah. And I remember telling her, we had the most amazing like year long uh, romantic uh, long distance relationship where I was flying to Mexico City every other week and she was flying here for 24 hours and FaceTime every night. And I remember for like a month before I go, this is going to be the greatest thing or the worst thing of you moving in. And we're going to know within six months whether this is going to be, hey. you know, potential for long, long term or yeah. like see you later back to Mexico type of thing. And we've just, I'm really proud of how we've communicated through it. That's cool. And uh, yeah, grateful for that. So that's really cool. <clears throat> well, again, it reminds me of something that Tony Robbins says, which is like the, the scalability of, of a business is really at the, the bottleneck of the psychology of the owner or the leadership. That's it, man. <clears throat> and so to, to let go of your, your ego and to actually look at collaboration and delegation is mm -hmm. an incredible character of yours. Yeah. Uh, switching gears a little bit, who, who would you say is, is the goat of basketball? MJ, Kobe, LeBron, someone else? <sighs> Watch I'm them. such an Ohio. I'm such an Ohio guy. Where I, I think if LeBron wins a couple more championships, then I think it's undeniable him. In my opinion, yeah. what is he at three right now? Three or three or four? I think if he matches Jordan in number of championships, I'll have to say him, just because he'll also have been playing the longest. I think. Well, Kobe played for what twenty years. Um, it's really hard to say, man, because the different players. I like Ohio pride and like going with LeBron. Right. But I've interviewed Kobe and man, that guy's mentality. I've never seen anything like it. I think he may have been more focused and intense than, than Jordan because I think he saw Jordan and he played against Jordan and he saw like him growing up. And mm -hmm. I think he probably learned what he did and then doubled it in terms of his mentality. Yeah. So I don't think anyone has had a mentality to work out that like Kobe. And, um, but hopefully LeBron will be the, uh, the greatest at one point so we'll see I, I just see the way that i see it and, and i haven't really studied much i just see like mj and kobe are kind of cut from a similar cloth and yeah. LeBron, they're LeBron, more LeBron. they're more of like i want the ball all the time i'm gonna win yeah LeBron is more of a teammate yeah where he's gonna make the best play yeah. even if it's not him yeah. scoring yeah. so i think it just depends on how you look as the greatest 
Mm-hmm. If LeBron had that mentality of like, I'm going to shoot every time, you know, half the shots, I'm going to hold the ball, I'm going to take it up, I'm going to score, then he would be the greatest in terms of that. Because, But I feel like because he has the ability <laughs> to see the game and play with everyone, yeah. it actually makes him more of a delegator. Yeah. You know, it's like, let me work smarter, yeah, not harder. Right. So it True. just depends. True. Uh, last couple of questions. One is uh, for someone who's listening and, and is, you know, kind of where you were in the sense of like on the couch, survival mode, you know, before you got your career started and they're just trying to keep their head above water. <clears throat> how would someone, how would you recommend if someone were sitting down with you and just asking, man, I need, I need more cash. I need to level my life. I need to improve my finances. I need to improve my life. Like in terms of actual improvement of income, adding more value, how would someone go about oh, simply versus wow. looking at you and being like, I could never achieve that. So why even try? Right. But like, yeah, I mean, if you just need, if you're broke and you need money, I'd say, go get a job. I would say there's a lot of people hiring, go get a job and get paid to learn. Yeah. You know, I feel like the people on my team are getting paid well to learn incredible skills Mm. from the entire team the collective mind of the team and just learn on the job so i think if you're broke and you feel like you don't have a lot of skills right now go get a job personally that's what i would do and in that process learn and research on the side about how to build a side hustle income about how to offer some type of service i met a guy a couple months ago who does uh, i had someone come hang up um some like a mirror and put together some ikea furniture at my place and i went on task rabbit for the first time and i was like i'm gonna look for the person with the best reviews because like my girlfriend's here i want to make sure it's a trustworthy person who's done a lot of stuff and i look at the most expensive person with the best reviews and the most reviews and it's something like his bio said something like it's like i was born to put together furniture for you and i go <laughs> done like <laughs> <laughs> this guy said like this is his bio you only have like a sentence or something in task rabbit like a little photo in your reviews i guess and i was like that's the guy i don't care if it's 60 dollars an hour like i feel like it's going to be trustworthy yeah. he's going to get the job done yeah. he comes there i start talking to him for a little bit i'm like how long have you been doing this he goes yeah a couple of years and i go what were we doing before he was like oh, i was teaching like fourth grade math or something for 10 years in la <clears throat> making 50 grand a year and i go and I started doing this on the weekend to make some extra cash. And then I realized like, wow, I actually really enjoy this. I'm like working out, I'm getting out, I'm meeting people, I'm driving around LA, uh, you know, it's easy. Yeah. And, um, and I started making more money doing this than teaching full time. And I can still have three months off if I want the summers off, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. So I think, um, <clears throat> I think working somewhere first is key if you need cash and then figuring out what are those unique skills that you could go do on the side right now mm-hmm. during that time to see if that's even something you want to do full time later. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it makes me think of <clears throat> just all the personality profile assessments that I've taken to better understand myself, to understand what my gifts are. And then to look at like, like, Oh, no wonder I, I didn't thrive here because that's just not my gift yeah. you know? here. Absolutely. So I'm just going to keep doubling down on creating relationships and events mm-hmm. That sort of thing. So I think you could do the same thing <clears throat> if you're listening to this. Yeah, and I think if you want like a, a, a strategy to increase skills and increase confidence, something I did from an early age was I would create a list of my top fears of the year. Yeah. And, you know, early on it was speaking in public because I was always intimidated from school, speaking out loud. Yeah. And I was scared to dance in public and salsa dance. And I was scared to learn an instrument and all these things. And I just said, okay, whatever my biggest fears are, I'm gonna go set out and do them this year. So one year I did Toastmasters and went to public speaking class every single week for a year. And I was horrible and embarrassed and the worst person there until I wasn't, until I practiced so much that I became better. Um, Same thing with salsa dancing. I was terrified to be in the middle of a dance floor with Latin people when I didn't understand the culture, the music or the, the dance, yeah. but doing it every single day for three and a half months and obsessing over it, I finally overcame the fear and then I actually came pretty good and then yeah. it was fun. So this thing that is a fear of yours could hopefully become something that's fun for you. Like I never thought I would be speaking publicly ever. 
ever. Never thought I'd get paid 150 grand for an hour of my time to speak in front of an audience. Yeah. Never in my life would you say, Lewis, one day you'll do this. I'd have been like, ha, huh, good luck. <laughs> because I couldn't even stand up in front of 10 people and read a sentence out of a book. And now it's become fun because I've spent so many hours in practice of overcoming the fear and I'm not afraid anymore. Mm. When, when you're afraid of something, it's not fun. But when you conquer the fear through your actual actions and the work and the time it took you to do it, you feel proud of yourself mm. and that pride turns into fulfillment and like, look, I can do this. Yeah. And it becomes fun to then go do the thing. Yeah. It became fun to speak in public as opposed to fearful and terrifying. Right. It became fun to go salsa dance as opposed to embarrassing when every girl rejected me. Right. It became fun to like put myself out there and meet girls on the street when before I, I would stutter saying hi to a girl mm -hmm. because now I could do it with confidence. Mm -hmm. So I would say, what, you know, whatever your fear is, go all in on the fear until it disappears. Mm -hmm. And that will now become a skill that you can use forever. And it, it does something more than just like, so... I like what you said, like go all in, double down on your, your talents and skills. Yes. And work on a fear at the same time. Mm -hmm. So like go make money on the thing you're really good at and focus on your fear until it just doesn't make you crippled anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe you use that thing. Maybe you don't, but it's no longer a thing that you're afraid of that holds you back. Right. It's no longer, uh, you know, a kryptonite in your bank when someone comes to you and is like, okay, Lewis, can you speak loud in front of this presentation? I'm like, no, I don't do that. I just write content. Mm -hmm. That's my thing I'm good at. But it's like, once you become good at this and that, right. and you have the, the dichotomy of those things, it's like, you just become recession proof. You become bulletproof right. and your confidence. Like if you go all in on the thing you're good at, your confidence increases a little bit because mm -hmm. you only have, you only increasing your level of skill set on it so much. You're already right. really good at it. Right. Can we get a little bit farther every day or month? But when you see a jump in something you're horrible at to, man, I'm actually like not that horrible anymore. Your confidence 10, 100 times on that and everything else in your life. Mm -hmm. So whatever that is, I would say write a list of your biggest fears and start tackling them one at a time. Yeah. Well, I think the way that I've seen it, I, sometimes our biggest fears are things that actually we're, we really enjoy, but we're so scared of failing at that thing. Like, hey, yeah, I mean, like, I love singing, but I'm never going to speak in front of people because I don't want to mess up, right? It's like, yeah. yeah. So I think it's, it's you're absolutely spot on with that. Yeah. Uh, last question would be like, have, have there been, I'm sure there has been, uh, can you think of something where you accomplished something that you've always dreamed of, of shooting for? And yet the feeling, the experience of accomplishing that thing was different than you thought it would, whether it be not necessarily worse, but just different. How did you deal with that, whether it actually was disappointment or it just was like, oh, I thought that this is the vision I had for achieving this and this was actually so different, maybe so much better. Hmm. That's kind of a, anything that you can think yeah, of. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I remember a lot of the big accomplishments like being an All-American and um, being a pro athlete. Like I had these dreams in my mind that when I accomplished them, I was super proud and happy in those moments. Mm -hmm. but then I remember within like 20, 30 minutes later, like not being as happy anymore. I was like, okay, this is something like being a New York Times bestseller. It's like, okay, this is something. I like to accomplish things where people can never take them away from you. Mm -hmm. Like you could never say I didn't jump this height in the high jump. Right. Like that's a, uh, an accomplishment that I was able to create through years of hard work or this number that a castle on or this many points a game or whatever. I love having things that people can't take away from you. Like being an all American athlete was something like I'll always have being a New York Times bestseller is something I'll always have. And I'm grateful mm -hmm. for those things. So it, it reaches a level of like almost like affirmation for myself to be like, yes, the years of hard work paid off and the outside validation or the outside credibility or this mark or this goal, you hit it. And so it kind of reaches this value of like, okay, yes, you are credible enough. You are worthy enough. You are talented enough. Mm -hmm. But I think I put a lot of emphasis on reaching them in terms of me being happy and justifying that need to kind of prove people wrong to where it was never enough still. Right. Now, when I accomplish something like that, it's more of like, this is awesome. And I'm still working on my mission. Yeah.
and I, I'm grateful. Cool. I'm on the cover of this magazine, mm -hmm. or I did an interview here yeah. where it used to be like, that's the milestone. Now it's just mm -hmm. like, okay, it's a great moment and mm -hmm. life continues. Let's keep serving. Let's keep being grateful. So that mentality has really um, shifted for me and brought a lot of perspective and just putting, I mean, I love to have emphasis on big goals, but then not wrap my identity around them and yeah. needing to accomplish it yeah. and making sure I focus on just being a good human every day. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like just the shift between being driven by uh, insecurity and seeking, you know, self-worth mm -hmm. versus knowing your self-worth and just really focusing on contribution and growth. <clears throat> yeah. And, and if I get a cover, if I get a New York Times bestseller, if I get this great, then it's cool. And it, and it, and it validates some certain things in my work, but you know, not to draw my happiness from that, you know, yeah, yeah. draw well, my happiness from the impact I'm making on other people, the results they're getting, the quality of life that they're having because of our work. Right. Right. Well, I so appreciate the time. And what's, what I love about you, Lewis, is that, you know, you certainly have evolved. I've evolved over the 20 something years that we've known each other. Right. And I, and what I'm grateful for is that the, the trajectory continues to, um, let me say this correctly, just like as we are both going to become more confident men in ourselves, you know, <clears throat> and more worthy and understanding our own self-worth that it's nice that, uh, you know, the younger versions of ourselves can be put to rest, you know, <laughs> exactly. uh, which is, which is a nice thing. And just, it just brings so much more enjoyment and love, but I will, I will just tell you again, and I've told you many times before, man, like if you, if you don't, if you guys don't know my story, I mean, the Lewis was there when I went through my divorce, yeah. you had me come out to the info empire you yeah. pushed me on my first website. You gave me, uh, you sent me the info product. Fit Body Boot Camp stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yep, boot Camp yeah. stuff. Yeah. You've invited me out to sit in on some of your podcast episodes. You've taken me uh, to your Sum of Greatness. Like, dude, you've been. MITT. Uh, yeah, you, you have, you've been instrumental in changing the trajectory of my life just as much as Tony Robbins, right? That's, I that's appreciate the, it. You too, for sure. Like, you're, you somehow became the guy that couldn't read, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to like my, my father figure in some way, you know, right, right, right. Uh, a mentor. So from that standpoint, I just, I, I owe you everything and I'm so grateful. So I uh, appreciate you, man. It's been yeah. fun. To, it's been fun to see the journey. And I think, you know, I, people continue to give to me in my life and mentor me and coach me. And you've been there for me for many different times when I was down and struggling and emotionally. And, and I think um, it's just always important to, to give as much as we can when we can. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I've always just appreciated your, your enthusiasm and your, your genuineness. Whereas a lot of other people that we went to school together with, I don't really keep up with anyone, yeah. except for maybe one or two people, you know? Yeah. So it's just because if people lose their enthusiasm and their engagement and their gratitude, it's like, you only have so much time to give to so many people. So. Right, right. Well, you're, you're, you are, like I've said, you're either a warning of what not to become or you're an example of what's possible. You know, and so many times I'm like, shit, if Lewis can do it from where he's coming from, <laughs> right, right, right. I can do this too. You exactly. know, like I feel like, oh man, like I'm struggling, but man, I just keep, you know, I just keep, I've been kind of watching, even from when you just started doing your networking events, you know, and all of our buddies were like, what's he doing? Self promoting. I'm like, no, but he's on to something. Man. <laughs> he's on to something. He's on to something. Just keep watching. Yeah. He's, he's doing it. You know, like, <laughs> I've been, I've been a, a fan of just, just your hard work ethic and your, appreciate your it, man. And, and your giving back. So again, appreciate it, man. That it's been, yeah. It's inspiring to see you create. And for those who don't know your whole story, you, you had a challenging time, man, of going through that. You had this vision of being with like the woman of your dreams forever. And then that identity and that relationship, not being what you thought it could be. And I'm sure half your fault, half her fault or whatever, and half just like you guys not being clear and whatever totally. and to, feeling let down and like, you know, embarrassed because of that at an early age when everyone else was maybe having successful marriages or whatever Absolutely. to having a corporate job and then getting out of that and being like, what am I going to do with my life? And yeah. how am I going to live up to the expectation of my dad, who's a successful guy yeah. to going into a thing that you were passionate about, which was helping women really lose weight, which is what an example from your story with your mom yeah. and seeing that hardship happen with her and her health challenges and continue down that path. And so I think that when you follow a mission, a thing that you're excited about, yeah. you're willing to do the work. And you worked for, I don't know, five, six, seven years on that yeah. fitness boot camp stuff yeah. in St. Louis, franchising it out, building it out. And then you realize that season of life, you wanted more. Mm. And 
you put that to the side and you, you use that into the next phase and into the next phase now, which is these men's retreats, which has been inspiring to watch online. And, um, you know, I love that you've been able to reinvent the offline to online events now because men need this work more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they showed up last night in, <clears throat> in mass, which is just great. It just shows that they're, they're wanting it and they're desiring it, you know? And so much of my transition from females to, to males is that, I was getting my self-worth from women, just like I was raised. Mom, yeah, sister, all of our female school teachers or Sunday school teachers. And I was going to the feminine to ask the question of, do I have what it takes like to be a man? Mm-hmm. And as much as I was getting that, it just was never enough. Wow. And, it's, and it's interesting how now it's like now getting all these guys who are believing in me, I, I'm like, oh, thank you. And, and my TT did that a lot for me. Mm-hmm. You know, just you, other, other men, Believing in me, just like women believing in other women is so empowering and, and impactful and empowering um, versus women getting validation from men, you know. Right, right, right. So there's some, some type of dichotomy there that works really well. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I'm on this journey because I'm so much more hungry and fulfilled. Yeah. And it's, I'm so much, it's more fun than it was, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. So, what's the vision this year for the, the men's work you're doing? What's the, what's the, the vision? Yeah, the vision is uh, releasing the book here in the next 30 days. Um, So that'll be fun. And that's kind of just laying out the whole framework of how to go from ultimately where I was to becoming king of your kingdom, you know, which is the life that you're building, that we're all building as men, you know. And that doesn't mean like domineering. It's about having your queen by your side and leaving impact and legacy. Um, And then that'll turn into, I think, longer uh, four or five day retreats or experiences. Mm -hmm. Yep. Up in the mountains, doing masculine things, just all with men. That's cool. You know? What's yeah. the book called? Becoming Kings. Ooh, yeah. that's clean. Yeah. It's coming so, out in 30 days, huh? Or next month? Yeah, I'm working on it every single, wow. every single day that I'm not doing interviews. With you. <laughs> that's good, man. <laughs> yeah. Can people pre-order yet or no? No, not yet. Not yet. <clears throat> but I'm, uh, yeah. Where do they go to get the information? Uh, just johnnyking.com. Okay. Yeah. So cool. I'm working on my podcast, obviously, following your lead and just like it adding value man just helping helping men heal so they can lead love and live on purpose you know when i wrote the masculine masculinity a few years ago and yeah. went through this journey of like healing from sexual abuse stuff and just like the process which i feel like is a lifelong journey of different stages of healing but after the initial kind of okay healing and taking a big step back i remember being like the world is in pain because of angry men who have not learned to heal amen and if the world, if the men of the world were able to heal or able to express themselves in a way where they felt was safe and were taught how to express themselves in a safe way, uh, there would be a lot better decisions made around peace and collaboration as opposed to war, fighting, hatred, jealousy, yep. um, you know, racism. There would be no racial marches and all this other stuff. It would be much more focused on, okay. Maybe I don't agree with your way or the way you do it, but like, how can we work together? Absolutely. And I think um, this type of work, I remember saying to myself, like, I don't have the time and energy and it's not my mission to like live this every day for this type of work. But I remember saying like, if I don't write a book of what I've learned and at least not put that out in the world, I'm doing a disservice to people. And I felt like I wanted to see more people doing that type of work because i I wish i had the time to do it but i'm trying to serve lots of like people but um if i wasn't doing this i'd probably be doing that type of work because i think that's what is the root cause of a lot of pain in the world yeah i completely agree and i think a lot of stuff i got out of mass masculinity especially the the documentary the masks we wear so powerful you know in terms of like oh yeah and this is this is why i had a, a failed marriage this is why i never fully committed myself to anything and why I felt like I was a, a waste of potential in my life. And, and I know that men who were feeling like me are, are way worse. They're the ones who are killing themselves six yeah. times more than, than women. It's like the men are hurting and then they take it out, you know, their insecurities out on women or children or, you know, world trade centers and stuff. Yeah, like exactly. That, right? yeah. So it's bullshit, but it needs, it needs to change. And, and I think uh, for us to not do it in our generation is just to, pass along to the next generation and, and yeah. that's about as irresponsible as it gets in my humble opinion yeah yeah <laughs> so, society man yeah i'm passionate title, title's called the kings, kings becoming, kings. Kings. becoming kings yeah 
What's the tagline? Do you know that yet? I'm still working on it. It's just kind of the idea of like becoming congruent, as congruent of a man as you can. Where you, what your word is, is is how you live your life. You I like know? it. Yeah, yeah. I like so, that a lot, man. You should read a book called uh, Rules of a Night. Rules of a Night. Okay. It's a short book by Ethan Hawke, the actor, which is actually really cool. Yeah, I'll check, check it out. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah, I really check it out. Well, thank you, Brent. Appreciate you so much. Um, of course. And, and, and people want to, you know, follow you and all stuff. What's what's the the quick lowdown. Just, uh, follow me at Lewis House anywhere online or School of Greatness podcast. Yeah, easy enough. Easy enough. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate it, Johnny. Thanks, man.